and welcome to the Sports Grad Podcast, your bite-sized guide to enter the sports industry. And joining me, as per usual, is the UAE Team Liaison Officer. How are you, Ruben? I'm fantastic. Thank you, Ryan. It's a pleasure to be doing a podcast with one of my key stakeholders, <laughs> the uh, Host City Liaison Officer, or HCLO, as uh, you prefer to be called. So I'm praying very hard that the UAE, who's my team they'll be working with, Get to make the trip over to Perth for the main tournament where I will come across you, no doubt, when we have an issue with the laundry or something like that. Yes, it's very exciting. I'm looking forward to handing the team's tickets to you and and doing all the really crucial jobs that the HCLO has to do. (laughs) Do you want to just give everyone some background first of all, what we're talking about? Ruben and I are going to be doing a short contract at the T20 World Cup, um, which is timely because of the guests that we have on today. Uh, so we're very excited. Ruben's a TLO. I'm a HCLO. Working with the teams on the ground. I'll be based in Perth. Ruben will be based in Victoria. But we're hoping if the UAE goes well, we'll be connecting up in Perth. I have faith. I, I have, have faith. faith. The Netherlands, we've been doing a lot of research on the Netherlands to look into their bowling attack and their batting lineup, and I think we've got them sorted. So we should make it into the main tournament. You, you've joined the analytics team of the UAE. I have. This as well, just to assess where, where the team's at. And so. I've dipped into the community, community to recruit an analytics team to support Team UAE to make sure that we make it further into the tournament. You are desperate to, to, for the team to push on, aren't you? <laughs> yes. Is it obvious? Uh, very, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it is. A little bit. <laughs> um, all right. Well, we've got a massive episode, so let, let's get cracking. I'm Ryan Walker. He is Ruben Williams. We are two mates who met at Cricket Australia, and now we help people find their own dream job through this very podcast and our online community. If you want to follow us, head over to LinkedIn or even better, if you want to connect with us and hundreds of others working in sport, jump inside the sports grade community. Now, speaking of our beloved sports grade community members, I want to give a special shout out to Zoe Van Malken all the way over in the Netherlands, believe it or not. Superstar. Absolute superstar, uh, who has just got a new job as a high performance consultant at Fusion Sport, which is an Australian company, believe it or not. Brilliant. Now, listen to this. This is something that uh, Zoe had to say on her job. She said that I now get to work in sports within a global company and keep building my own motorsports company as well. She's a massive F1 fan. Uh, grew up in the same town as Max Verstappen. Ah, he'd be listening, so shout out to Max. <laughs> he would be listening. Uh, something I didn't know was possible but got greatly encouraged to do so through this platform, being the community. Also, I'm hopefully signing a deal with my company next week as well. So... Zoe has got it all going on at the moment. She's working remotely. She's dealing with Max Verstappen. She's starting her own Formula One company. She's an absolute jet. But if you are like Zoe and you want to get your foot in the door of the sports industry or you like fusion sport and you want to save time hiring good people quickly and easily or you just want to connect with other people in sport and meet some of the people working at the T20 World Cup, for example, or Cricket Australia, the AFL, you name it. There's something for everybody inside the sports grad community. So head to our website to get involved, www.sportsgrad.com.au forward slash community. Fantastic. And Zoe, you'll get herself some new kit from the Iconic who have, we, we've been very lucky to, to team up with to provide all our sports grad members with new kit when they get a job. So mm. she's got a special little discount in her inbox. Uh, but those listening can also jump on the icon. You can get 20% off when you use sports grad at the checkout. Cue everyone bolting to the icon <laughs> and getting your kit. So check that out, sports grad at the checkout. Um, but Rubes, as usual, we have to give some love to our good friends at Deakin University who have been a supporter of ours. I would love to know the amount of days since day dot it was, but it has been <laughs> since day dot. Um, so if you're studying or you've currently or you've just finished studying, having a postgrad qualification in sports management on your resume can give you a massive leg up over the potential candidates applying for that same role. So if you want to pump out your resume and get specialised knowledge in just about every single area of sport you could possibly find, take a look at Deakin's postgrad qualifications. Their Master of Business in Sports Management is not one of, but the best one in Australia, ranked at number one. So it's a no-brainer. Add a postgrad to your resume, and that's our little tip for today. Now, Ryan, when I say the words chartered accountant to you, what comes to mind? Uh, Cubicles. (laughs) Not the most interesting job in the world, you might think. Well, but that, that we know of. That we know of. <laughs> At first thought, there's a lot of stereotypes attached to accountants. Yeah. 
But our guest today is Michelle Enright, who is the CEO of the T20 Men's World Cup. And she is a chartered accountant by trade. Now, Michelle started off with her accounting uh, qualifications by working in the New Zealand Academy of Sport. She went down a very untraditional route with accounting and has taken into sport to do a lot of good. From the New Zealand Academy of Sport, she stepped into the FIFA Under-20 World Cup, then into the Gold Coast Commonwealth Games. She then became the COO of the ICSE Women's T20 World Cup back in 2020 and then stepped into the CEO role for the Men's World Cup. So she's been able to take a typically uh, say vanilla career and turn it into something that's quite, quite attractive and jazzed up. So... Um, definitely gone out of the cubicle. Absolutely, absolutely. I think there'll be a lot of accountants looking at Michelle thinking, how do I get that career? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so a couple of things to look forward to. Number one is Michelle's journey to becoming the CEO. It is quite fascinating. She's an absolute inspiration. Um, so you can hear all the different steps that she's taken to get to where she's now. Yeah, you can also hear about her experience as a female leader uh, in a male-dominated industry. We know that is definitely changing. Uh, but we asked her about her experience being a female CEO, which is really awesome, to be honest. Now, events are pretty hectic. Being a CEO is even more hectic. So we had to find out how does Michelle keep a bit of work-life balance so that she's got the energy to keep going. So we're taking a little bit of a different angle w- with Michelle and found out, you know, how do you keep your cup filled up? So some good tips in there from Michelle. Yeah, and finally... Michelle took over from Nick Hockley, who was the CEO of the Women's World Cup and the Men's World Cup. And then during the pandemic, he obviously went to CA. So we asked her what it was like taking over from a CEO, probably not halfway, but, you know, a little bit of a a way into the planning of the tournament, which was was also great to hear. Mm. Great. We'll grab a pen. Enjoy this chat with Michelle Enright. Michelle, welcome to the Sports Grade podcast. Amazing, lovely to be here, really excited to have a chat today. Michelle, the the T20 World Cup is kicking off what is called the golden decade of sport in Australia. How excited are you for the tournament and what are you uh, most looking forward to? We're super excited because this is going to be the biggest global sporting event in Australia this year. And in fact, probably we think since the pandemic, I don't know if... um, you guys were fortunate enough to be at that record-breaking women's T20. Yes, Cup I was final. there. I was yeah. in the crowd. <laughs> it was the last straw, really, before we mm. were in our houses for months on end. So I, know. I don't so remember. We, we did that amazing event, and now we um, feel pretty fortunate. The unfortunately, the event was postponed, but fortunately, to um, 2022. So now the country's kind of alive and buzzing. So I guess what we're most looking forward to is being the event that kind of brings everyone out of their houses again right across the country because, of course, we're in seven great host cities and uh, really looking forward to having, well, the world's best cricketers from 16 international teams. Um, There's 45 matches over four action-packed weeks, so we really want to make sure that those teams have just a fantastic time in Australia and are able to perform at their best. There'll be some winners and losers, of course, but our job is to make sure that they can play their best cricket and, and really entertain the fans. And then just really looking forward to all the fans getting out and seeing these cricketers. And whether you're a cricket fan or not, I think we all know T20 is the entertaining form of the game. There's going to be cool things for kids to do. You know, all of the cities have done an amazing job. They've got fan zones around the stadiums as well. So... Um, you're just looking forward to everybody getting out and reuniting and, and having a great time at the cricket. Nice. Do you reckon the Aussies can can go back to back? <laughs> what do we think? Well, as the uh, CEO of the local organising committee, <laughs> I'm a, you know, neutral Switzerland, so <laughs> yeah. we've got, all teams have got an equal chance. Absolutely. And, and actually, I think there was a blockbuster game last night, even West Indies gave the Aussies a mm. run for their money, yeah. didn't they? So, and we saw Sri Lanka, who were also in that qualifying round. They won the Asian Cup, beating India and Pakistan. So, um, But, of course, I mean, the, the woman lifted the trophy on home soil. So, yeah. you know, the men have got a bit of a challenge there uh, and to start with, let alone also being... Um, going, trying to be back-to-back champions. So yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, Ryan and I are very excited for the tournament. Ryan's going to be managing a hotel over in Perth, where I think India, Australia, and England are coming through. I'm going to be working as a TLO with the UAA, UAE team. So we, we can't wait for it either. Now we have uh, dived into a number of career journeys of some T20 staff in the past. 
I think episode number one was with uh, Ali Durkis, the HR manager. We've had Jack Lloyd in from marketing. We've had Max Abbott from comms. We've had Will Taylor from social media. We've finally got the CEO. <laughs> Can We've you worked t- our way up, haven't we? Oh, we have. Okay. We no, have. You, no, you've started with the BC. You've, <laughs> you've done a good job. <laughs> um, take us back to the start of your career and can you share with us some of the steps that led you to getting this role? Yeah, well, I don't hold it against me, but I've started my career as a chartered accountant and, and still are, you know, hold that qualification. So that's just been a, um, I guess, a profession that's allowed me to do a whole heap of exciting things. So early on in my career, I worked, for example, for Dimin... I'm a, I'm a Kiwi, by the way, I'll just declare that. <laughs> um, oh, I we got that, don't worry. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I worked for a brewery in um, New Zealand for the hotels division. I also worked when Dominion Breweries first bo- bought Pepsi Cola into New Zealand. I was a startup accountant there. Um, I had some time in the UK um, working for a software startup software company there. So I've kind of always been drawn to fast paced startup, let's, you know, do something special with this thing. And then um, when my um, husband and I came back from overseas, we were, uh, that's when I really started my journey in sport. And I had a, um, we had our daughter then, so I managed to get a part-time job with Netball New Zealand. And I think once you've worked in sport, uh, there's no going back. <laughs> it's um, it's just feels like you're doing something that actually really makes a difference in, in all sorts of different ways. And so I spent some time with Netball New Zealand where I actually did my first major event, which was a Netball World Champs. And then um, following the Sydney Olympics, actually, when New Zealand had a bit of a dismal um, showing there, Australia did a great job. We uh, mimicked the Australia Academy of Sports System. So I was, again, kind of the start-up kind of finance business services role for the Academy of Sport in New Zealand and stayed there for quite a while as it kind of morphed into high performance sport New Zealand. So I've kind of seen sport from an NSO and a high performance sport system and now major events. Uh, So I left there, um, FIFA was brought their under 20 men's uh, World Cup to New Zealand. So I was uh, director business services or something the title was, <laughs> <laughs> all that kind of back office stuff. Um, was kind of like the deputy CEO there. And then once I'd worked on major events, I really got the bug. So I think that's kind of, to me, the pinnacle of sport as well. So you do two amazing things. One is you really inspire the next generation of budding athletes. So, you know, we've heard so many stories, whether it's whatever sport it is, AFL, football, cricket, swimming, where people have seen watched either a World Cup or a Olympics or something and seen a superstar and thought, I want to be like that one day. So, you know, you're doing something that's really empowering. And we've found, for example, with the Women's World Cup, the participation in women and girls in cricket has doubled since then. So you really can make a difference to people getting active and getting out there or staying in the sport longer. Um, there's that side of it. And then the fact that when you put on a major event, and especially like this men's T20 World Cup, you're kind of showing Australia to the rest of the world. So it's something that I find makes people and communities really proud to be a part of. And like you guys doing these amazing jobs, helping us out, there's you know all sorts of other people that get involved, whether it's from the state cricket associations, whether they're just helping net bowlers, be net bowlers, we've got volunteers. But you find you touch people in all sorts of different ways, and it... Um, I know it really. I think you feel like you're working on something that has that has a purpose. So that's kind of where I'm at now. This is my f- uh, after the FIFA event in New Zealand. I worked on the Com Games on the Gold Coast. That was really exciting. So 2018. Now, yes. That was, yeah. Yes. Yeah. I was head of finance there. Our budget was a billion dollars. I had to ask how many zeros that was at the time. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> I wasn't saying that many zeros on, on your Excel spreadsheet. <laughs> I know. And then um, came to this event, um, was the COO for the women's event. And then, of course, when Nick Hockley was uh, moved to Cricket Australia as the CEO, I was very fortunate to take his seat. So now I have this role for the men's. But the people you've interviewed, we've, um, you know, they... They do all the hard work. I get to you know, have yeah. the best job with a lot of leading the team. <laughs> what What was that like taking over from Nick? Because that would be not unusual, but it, you know, you, you I guess you weren't there at the very start. You've kind of come in. Yeah. What was that like taking over? Was it challenging? Well, I think because I'd been part of the team and um, I, in my role, I kind of had half the organisation reporting through me 
in any yeah. case, and I'd worked really closely with Nick, and we were a really close senior management team, and myself and two of the other general managers, we've stayed on right the way through, so we kind of had a core nucleus yeah. of people that knew each other, and um, I had, I've had i had great support from them, so it actually wasn't too difficult. Yeah, nice. <laughs> it was probably easier than coming in, like for a first-time CEO role, to have worked your way up internally um, has been really helpful yeah. for me, I think. Nice. Um, one thing we're interested to learn about is what does your day-to-day look like? For someone who's leading a major event, yeah. what does the day-to-day look like? Well, at this stage of the event, it's a lot about doing radio interviews, um, doing this, which is amazing. <laughs> doing um, the rounds of media, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we've got our trophy tour underway. So Tuesday I was in Sydney. We had um, a greatest hit promotion. The team, um, government team down there at Office of Sport and Destination New South Wales did an amazing job and we had the Premier and the Minister and so I was, you know, had a little speech there and then you're just, you know, saying hi and thank you to them and then it's really just um, unlocking any roadblocks for the rest of the team so if there's things that they've needed to escalate because they can't, you know, can't be resolved then I kind of get in and help out and Sometimes just because the CEO gets not particularly that I do anything <laughs> magical, but it's just that people think the CEO is now asking for this. Sometimes it, it happens. So um, that at this stage of the game, it's, that's, a, that's a, promoting the tournament, making all the valued stakeholders feel a real part of it and unblocking any, any roadblocks. With yeah. And uh, how do you expect that to change once the tournament starts off? Well, I... Uh, the beauty of these is you do so much work beforehand and once you kick off, um, then you're just fine-tuning things and, and staying nimble and agile and, goodness, fingers crossed for the weather. So I expect that um, I'm in, we're hosting VIP hospitality in each city, so I'll be there again, um, you know, thanking all the important stakeholders and then really just keeping, you know, I, I love um, making sure that the team feels okay and is well enough resourced and, and again just helping with any issues here but you know they'll be able to resolve most things so um, uh, I want to enjoy some of the cricket as well. So you're kind of like the barometer by that point, you're the, you're the vibe check trying to make sure the team's up and about and yep. delivering a great tournament. Yeah I think so. The barometer, I love that. <laughs> <laughs> CEO's role is to be the barometer of the tournament. <laughs> well we've got, I mean you've interview, uh, interviewed Ali Durkis, I mean she's done such an amazing job for us and her and her team, she's got a, um, off her wingman Matt there, they've recruited um, an amazing team and um, you've probably got a sense we don't have you know there's no egos in our team everyone's just like oh there's an issue here who can help and who's the best person who do we need to ask so I exp- that'll carry on right through tournament time and so my my job is you know, I feel pretty lucky really. Mm. <laughs> Ali was our first ever interview. Oh, mm. oh wow. Num- episode number one. <laughs> didn't, the setup didn't look like this. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we, we won't even go into what the setup was that day. <laughs> <laughs> and you've had Will and Max here there, brilliant. And Jack, oh gosh, well, yeah, we've got some real, um, yeah, real kind of superstars. And, and I think that's the environment that we've tried to create, where people can come and do their best work. And we're all sort of learning, you know, especially some of that digital stuff. And you know, Will's been pioneering the squads platform, and you know, Max has got amazing, amazing relationships with media, but it's still a lot of hard work making sure you can get everyone along for the things you need and lining up talent. And, and Jack, that whole digital age now has allowed us really to reach more fans and tell people more about the event. So, um, want to touch on your experience, I guess, as a CEO and what it's like being a female CEO in sport, um, because obviously. There is a lot of male domination out there in the sports industry, but it's fantastic to see more and more female CEOs coming through. Yeah, you're right. And I think even, you know, some of the chairs in AFL and I think the chair of the Com Games that has just been set up is a female as well. So um, I'm really heartened by, I guess, the way that's going. And I think in my career, I, I just feel really fortunate. I don't feel I've ever been either disadvantaged or given a token or, you know, unfairly advantaged because I was a female mm. and I think that's a good credit to cricket as well I mean there was no question of um, I'm leading a men's T20 World Cup we need to have a man at the helm or anything like that it was um, who's the right person for the job and and I think actually events bring a special um, characteristic as well when you're starting up a business quite quickly I mean we've almost got 50-50 not quite I think we're slightly more males but 
you know, that's a pretty um, balanced and even organisation. Our senior management team's 50-50. We've got two of six on the board, so right throughout the organisation. I think that's part of what's made us such a successful team too. So, I mean, it's only one element of diversity, of course, but it's, um, you know, it's one that's had a lot of focus recently. So I guess I've, yeah, I've just found it kind of neutral, if, if you know what mm. I mean, mm. in my role. So Yeah. Mm. And I... I mean, I like to joke a bit, I think it, it it kind of balances out. We had a male in charge of the women's T20 World Cup and now we've got a female in charge of the men's yeah. T20 <laughs> World Cup. So nice equilibrium. Yeah, it's yeah. a nice, um, nice balance. Nice. In terms of um, some of the, the issues that lead to gender inequality, what are some of the challenges that you've seen over your years of working in sport? I'm not sure that I've seen too much of that in the organisations I've been in because, I mean, for example, when I worked in Netball New Zealand, that was was the other way, I guess you could say, being a largely female sport. We had a little bit to do with the men's association. We had a male CEO for a while, so in some ways that was um, probably harder. You know, we had definitely had way more females in there just because of the nature of the sport, yeah. so I can see how that would happen, and I haven't experienced that because I haven't really worked, I guess, for you know heavily male Base sport, but I think, I think what we see happening with participation with all of the sports now, and, and cricket's kind of leading the way, I think, and how they're supporting the women's and girls programs to grow. Then we're starting to see that reflected right through um, all of the layers, so the management and governance, and um, yeah, I think it's going to take a continued focus. And I know CA keep stats on, all, but you know, certainly on all of that sort of stuff, and they're very conscious of it. And I think it just. It just makes sense, doesn't it? We're a population that's, I don't know, roughly 50-50 male-female, so it makes sense that your leadership kind of reflects the, the population base and, and you, you know, it's it's your fan audience, it's it's your participation base. So mm. yeah. It makes sense. It, it sounds like it stems at that participation level. You know, typically men have only been allowed to play sport once women are allowed to play sport as well. Yeah. Then the people working in sport are naturally going to even out too. Yes, yeah, mm. I think so. But you're right, I think some, it, you know, there's some stereotypes somewhere along the way that are harder, you know, and it, and I guess the traditional role of women, we have, you know, traditionally been the ones to stay home and now that, um, you know, we're empowered and we're, you know, more educated as well to go out and have good careers, I think. You know, I've got a son who's mid-twenties and his girlfriend has, you know, got a great career and I can see as a couple there... You know, that's just business as usual for them. They're both going to get on with their careers and they'll sort out something with the family. So I think times are, are, are changing as well. It's probably this generation, I guess, I've kind of come through that's you know, struggled a bit more, but hopefully things are, you know, I'm really heartened, I guess, to see what you know, the leadership roles mm. that women are getting. Mm. Is, is there any particular advice that you pass on to young female leaders coming through? I think, uh, I think it's always to back yourself. So... I think there's still that, and I'm guilty of that, a bit of an inherent trace of sometimes stepping back and, um, you know, and you would have heard this time and time again, if you don't tick everything on the list of requirements, still, you know, uh, not many people do. So I think it's, um, and it's been really good for me actually moving to Australia from New Zealand because Kiwis are a little bit, I think, like that as well. Like sometimes Australians have more confidence to back themselves. So I think that's just that. You know, be your own um, best advocate and be comfortable and confident in who you are and um, you'll go as far as you want to, the sky's the limit, really. If you're, you know, a genuine, hard-working person and, and um, yeah, don't ever, I guess, always err on the side of, yeah, I think I'll have a go at that as opposed to, oh, I'm not quite sure. Yeah. Because um, the worst that can happen is it doesn't work out, but at least you've tried. Mm. Yeah. Love that. <laughs> <laughs> I do love that. Um, <clears throat> let's uh, let's switch back to the World Cup specifically. Um, what are you most excited about seeing come to life? Um, well, I tell you what, these World Cups, when they come, they've, if you get a chance to walk past the MCG, they've started putting the signage up. So our colours, they're bright. They're like pink and blue. So I do love the branding <laughs> of the World Cup. I must yeah, say. it is fantastic. It's, yeah. it's super cool. Well, thank our man Jack Lloyd specifically yeah. for that. Jack Lloyd probably did the whole thing, <laughs> yeah. so well done. <laughs> So actually, I should have worn my, worn my bright top. But um, <laughs> so the stadiums will come to life, not just with the signage, but then you bring in sports breeze and music. We've got Kojo. They just take it to the next level. And we're yeah. really, 
we've been, you know, Will's been working on playlists and all sorts to hero the visit of the competing team. So it'll be really tailored to them. So they'll be it'll be colourful, there'll be music, we'll have roving entertainers, there'll be the fan zone, the food will be tailored, you know, to the competing teams and um, then the the cricket, I mean the T twenty cricket will be exciting. So I guess I'm just I'm looking forward to the teens being able to take the field and do their thing and the fans just soaking up that atmosphere. And then, of course, once you get to the final, we'll, um, we've got a bit of mixed reality in the pipeline Ooh. and some pretty innovative things for fans. So, Katie Perry's not coming back, surely. She's, no. <laughs> but, you know, she was perfect. She was amazing. Mm. Yeah, you know, all empowering woman. And yeah. she really spoke to that for us as well. So She was incredible. Was lucky enough to get on the field that night. Mm. Were you? It was, uh, was oh. very good. Mm. Yeah, we couldn't believe it ourselves. It's like a full. It was eighty six thousand one hundred and seventy four fans at that yeah. final. So incredible. Is there anything that you can share with us now that people can look forward to? Well, <laughs> we we will have entertainment for sure. And this time, so the purpose of the men's is really bringing generations and cultures together. So the women's was about you know kind of that uplifting woman and girls sport, and that's why Katy Perry was perfect. So because this is about generations and cultures, we feel it's appropriate to have um, homegrown talent. So, um, you know, for the kind of leading the way. So we, we will have an Australian artist. Nice. Um, but we're also, it's not just going to be, it won't be a, a, you know, what do you call them? A-list. A <laughs> but it'll be more of a, we really want to um, celebrate the competing teams as well. So again, that nature of bringing everyone together. So um, it'll be a bit of a, a, a closing celebration as opposed to kind of a rock star yep. out there, mm. belting out the tunes. So, nice. Yeah, but more inclusive. With, yeah. Awesome. And ju just on that, what, what do you think the um, the legacy of the T20 World Cup is going to be? Well, what we're really focusing on this multicultural aspect. So um, as we know from the last census, like Australia's got, I think it's 51% of us that are either born overseas or um, our parents were. And it's such a beautiful country that people can live safely with such a diverse population base like that. So we really want to hero that and get as many people from diverse communities and cultures included in the event so you know we've set up a t20 champions program to kind of help us spread the word far and wide so what i'm looking forward to is seeing people not just of the competing teams but all different na nationalities coming together um around the shared love of cricket and actually it's interesting of the overseas tickets we've sold we've sold them to 82 different countries so wow. i think Jeez. that gives you a bit of a taste of who's coming from overseas and then you know we'll have that we've got that diversity within australia so i'm just looking forward to seeing all of the all of those different people from all ages and backgrounds and cultures coming together to see the world's best yeah. cricketers in action i just want to dive into like the the strategy behind the legacy piece for a mm -hmm. second where does that conversation start and how does it get carried through over years to, to this point? Yeah, good point, Ruben, because we're kind of like a, not a one-day wonder, but we, mm. we'll all be packing up shop pretty soon after the mm. final. So um, on that, I guess it's a two-legacy piece. One is that kind of multicultural and wanting to increase the representation of multicultural Australia in the sport of cricket. And the other is just getting more kids you know, picking up a bat and a ball. So we do work closely with Cricket Australia on that and then really you pass the mantle to them and they run with it. But there's a couple of um, particular things we've done. One is um, you interviewed Will, so he'll be part of you know, part of the team that's built up the squad's platform will be continuing to work for CA after our event, so they'll carry on that great initiative. And we also were fortunate... Um, some of the team put together an application to government for some federal funding around this multicultural piece. And that includes things like um, funding squads for a period of time. But also we can see now there's participations happening more broadly across many different cultures, but it's not always reflected in, you know, parents of different ethnic backgrounds going on the committee or being the coaches or the umpires. So there's some funding set aside to encourage that. So... Um, I guess leveraging the World Cups enabled us to unlock that funding together with CA. So there's um, some initiatives like that that will carry on afterwards. So. Nice. And then the other aspect of legacy is that we'll reach new fans that might not currently be attending, for example, BBL matches or um, some of the international series. So we'll have a, um, a great database of fans as well that we'll be able to share with CA so that they can carry on the conversation with them and, yeah. and um, get them back to the next big thing. Nice. Awesome. Um, 
what what keeps you up at night in regarding to work? I, like, <laughs> I feel like that's what, you know, we had a, a few of our um, members in today yeah. talking about a few things. We said, well, what would you ask the, the T20 World Cup CEO? And I think that's something that they, you know, it's just a question around what goes through your head yeah. at, at the very top and, uh, you know, what worries you the most? Well, I tell you what, I've learned over the years that losing sleep actually holds you back because then you're just tired the next day. So <laughs> <laughs> what I try and do is, and and I find the way to solve worry is to get to the bottom of what's causing the worry and, and try and solve that. So that's kind of the philosophy I've always had. So, you know, you work really hard during the day and I tell you I sleep like a log at night, but, you know, I'm very meticulous. You have your, however you do your to-do list, whether it's through your Outlook or on your pad or your generation's probably something digital, but um, I'm very clear on what the priorities are, what the things I need to solve. And it's that same age-old thing that sometimes people put off, put off the biggest things that need solving, where if you, if you deal with them first, you find you're far less worried, then the little things are easy to knock off. So sometimes in the past I've fallen into the trap of doing the things I'm comfortable or easy so that I can, and then you've still got the big thing to tackle, mm. and that's the one that'll give you worry. Yeah. But um, I think for us it's, you know, the pandemic was always going to be a challenge now that that's landing well. Ticket sales, you do your best, but you're still reliant on some things coming together, weather and, you know, good high-profile teams making the final. And um, so, you know, there's still things that are moving and shaking, but, um, yeah, I find you better to put your energy into trying to move those things along as yeah. opposed to worrying. And there's things you can't mm. control yeah. as well. Mm. Yeah, and you yeah, work out, yeah, try and get your good strategies in place, know that you've put in as much effort as you can and then just keep it, you have to always keep some headspace to be agile and yeah. not get, um, yeah, there's a couple of, it. we've had some good staff gatherings and the, you know, there's a good couple of examples I've shared of things where if you take your, you know, you have to keep your eye on the ball right to the end of these events as well because once they get going you can think, oh, this is all going well but, you know, you've, it's not until you've delivered the final ball, the teams have left the country, that you can really kind of take the foot off the gas. But yeah. Mm. <laughs> and, and how do you um, refill your cup? Like when you're going out doing hard work every single day, how yeah. do you kind of get energised again for the next day? Is there any sort of self-care that you do or anything that kind of keeps you going? Well, I think exercise is, is really important. Um yeah, whatever your love of that is and nature. I live here in Richmond, so we're really close to the Botanic Garden. So honestly, you just pop down to that river. And Perfect. Even if you've got 10 minutes, it kind of recharges you. And then I like baking. So that's like, you know, my kind of <laughs> form of meditation is when I'm, you know, measuring and cooking. I'm, you know, I'm really loving that. So uh, that's a really important point though, Ruben. You just have to refill your cup and spend time with friends and go and do, you know, get out of the house and... You know, sometimes you go and do something somewhere else, change the scenery for a couple of hours and you're away again. So, yeah, it's really important. Because uh, things get out of, can get out of perspective if, if your whole focus is on life. And when you're involved in these major events, they can kind of take over your life. But at the end of the day, they're a part of your life. And you'll be a better person at work, I think, if you have a well-rounded experience and, you know, good doing things with your friends and just seeing what else is happening in the world other than your little universe of t20 cricket or whatever it happens to be yeah. <laughs> does the rest of the team know that you love baking because i'm thinking yes. i think they might be a few requests <laughs> after this well i did much more baking for the women's i've been but i haven't really had the same time to and also i've got my son living with me now whereas before um i was on my own for the women's and um so I'd bake a cake and take it into work, whereas I have to get it past him first now to get it out. It'd be half so. eaten by the time it makes it to, <laughs> yeah. to T20 HQ. Yeah, but no, I still I enjoy that. And, it, you know, who doesn't like a bit of cake at this time as well? Yeah, absolutely. from the CEO yeah, as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What's um? So the tournament ends. What do you think's next? Well, um, so for... You're right, this, everybody's out of a job, so some finish yeah. sooner than others. So at the moment I'm staying, we kind of have our final board meeting end of February and that's our wrap-up, but most of the team will finish up um, before Christmas and then it'll just be the um, legal and finance doing the numbers and yeah. closing out the contracts that finish up. And, um, yeah, I'm definitely, I'll be definitely looking to work on another major event, so... Nice. No doubt about that. And that's, a, you know, Australia's well, ahead of the game. Next yes, 10 years, yes. there's mm. how many? 
It's well, a golden they, decade. It's yeah, I mean, they've already had, I think in their 10, because that was a New South Wales initiative, wasn't it? And they've counted the UCA iCycling. They've had the FIBA basketball. Yeah. They've got us. There's rugby in a few years. Yes. Mm. FIFA. Women's women's, football. Yeah. Com Games here now. um, And the Olympics, Olympics, 2032. So Mm. very exciting. It's it's great for your, you know, all your grads. There's a real, you know, Australia has a great reputation for major events. So there's a real kind of pathway now for people. You don't have to scatter yourself all over the world. But, of course, you can do if you want to. Mm. And for those people looking to take their career from one event to the next to the next, do you have any final pieces of advice for those looking to work in sport? Yeah, I think it's probably no different to anywhere else. You just come in, you you know, you do the best job that you can and I think it's played out with me. I've I've never been one to sing my own trumpet and say, Look at me you and try and push you know, but I have faith now because I guess I've experienced that that people notice good work being done and never be afraid to ask. So don't think you have to know it all or be you know, I'm still learning heaps. You know, you're learning right through your career, so just ask and, you know, don't be afraid to learn from others and just do your best work and nobody's perfect and keep moving and I'm sure you'll have a great career and go as far as you want to. Fantastic. Well, Michelle, we've absolutely nailed the timing, I must say. <laughs> uh, we had 30 minutes to spare and we've pretty much hit on the dot. Uh, well, we are in so major events. We are. Mind, it's so a very hectic know, time. time. We are very good with our run sheets and <laughs> schedules and whatnot. But uh, thank you very much for coming in, uh, especially at this time, given you know the tournament is just days away. Um, but just fantastic hearing your experience right now in the tournament where it's come and what you've done to sort of get to where you are. And I think by the time this goes out, we'll be under your company banner. So you are our CEO at at, at this current (laughs) moment in time. Um, But, yeah, we're super excited and, you know, we've looked at the World Cup for, you know, years now, going from the women's to the men's and it's super exciting and it's a great event. So, yeah, yeah, thanks so much for coming on. Uh, Thanks for having me. See you very soon. Well, Rubes, half an hour of just super interesting content there. We, we were on a budget, and by budget I mean a time budget, uh, but I feel we nailed uh, most bases. I loved how Michelle talked about her work-life balance. I think that was awesome. Yeah, I know. I'm going to go start cooking after this. Yeah. <laughs> um, but the uh, number one thing that I'm taking away from Michelle is just to back yourself and be your own biggest fan. Um, she mentioned the issues around, you know, self-doubt that can creep into particularly women in a male-dominated industry. Uh, If you find yourself facing that same sort of self-doubt, take some inspiration from Michelle, back yourself in because you do have to be your own biggest fan and often you're a lot more competent then you probably give yourself credit for. So back yourself in and go after whatever it is you're chasing. Yeah, absolutely. I just mentioned work-life balance. Michelle's talking about what she does to re-energise herself and she mentioned she lives in Richmond. She's got the Yarra River right there. She's got botanical gardens there. She's got the tan. So she goes and does a bit of fitness but also a bit of baking just to take her mind away from the rigours of being a CEO at the very top. So if you're listening and you kind of get bogged down in, in work and you, you struggle to get away from it, just find something that re-energises you a little bit, whether that's going for a run, playing a video game, cooking going for a walk, whatever it is, just find something that you can rely on each and every time that'll re-energise you. I love that from Michelle. She became very relatable when she talked about her baking. (laughs) (laughs) The baking CEO, I love it. Yeah, how good. Um, And then finally, if you are considering a career change, Michelle said at the top of the episode, once you go into sport, you never go back. And even if you have a background in another industry, your skills can be transferred over into the sports industry. Michelle's been able to do it from accounting. People have been able to do it from other industries as well. So it is possible. And as Michelle said, it's one of the best experiences you'll ever dive into once you get here. So if you are considering that, why not take the plunge and pursue a career in sport? Nice one. Hey, um, we've had a few CEOs on. So what are some other episodes sort of around, you know, from the CEOs that we've had that people can enjoy that sort of relate to what Michelle was talking about. Yeah, well, Kelly Ryan is another fantastic female CEO. She features in episode 185. She's the CEO of Netball Australia. 
Uh, Libby Owens, another terrific female CEO who heads up Champion Data, who provide all the data to just about every major sport in the country. Huge organization. Uh, she is in episode 206, I believe. And then... That might be bang on. Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> and then um, for another CEO, um, David Pryles from Hockey Australia features in episode 171. So there's a few big dogs there to go go keep yourself happy with. Absolutely. Awesome. Well, connect with us on LinkedIn. Plus, be sure to jump into the SportsGrad community. We would love to chat with you in there. So head to our website at sportsgrad.com.au slash community to join or head to the link in our show notes. Also, if you love the show, we would love for you to rate the show five stars wherever you listen to your podcast. Subscribe on Apple or follow on Spotify. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.